meeting is being recorded. Hold this for. This got it nothing. Zoom meeting. Good evening, everybody. Thank you, Sarah, for honoring this invitation for coming to read for us this evening. We um we look forward to what's going to be shared and for the discussion to come. For those of of you who are a meeting or encountering Sarah's work for the first time, she's an editor and poet currently located in Durban in KZN. Sarah is a published poet. She, uh, her debut collection, Conduit, was published in 2011. And I believe that um, she's publishing a collection later this year with a caravan, caravan press called River Fugue. Uh, we, look, we look forward to, to reading it. And I do hope that you um, can tell us a little more about your forthcoming publication. Um, Sarah will read for about 30 to 35 minutes, then we will have an opportunity to comment and ask some questions before we break for an open mic. All right. Thank you, Sarah. The floor is yours. Thanks, Lisa, for that kind introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to tell you about my second collection, River Fugue. It's been a long time in the pipeline. Um, I attended a WITS online creative writing course um, four years ago and had a body of work from there that I sent to various printing presses trying to get it published. And Robert Berold from Deep South was one of the editors I sent my work to, and he said, it's not ready to be published, but let's work together and see what happens. And River Fugue is what happened. Four years later, it's now ready and Karina from Caravan Press is very kindly publishing it. And all things going well, I'm hoping to see the hard copy by um, September, so quite soon. Um, and in, you'll hear the poems, they're mostly about um, uh, nature and relationships and very intertwined, those two um, themes. Um, and trying to find a resolution for a very troubled childhood. Um, the, the the book is divided into four sections and um, I'll be reading your poems from all four of them. But let me not say too much and let the poems just speak for themselves. And um, the book begins with um, a quote from a poem by Khalil Gibran. The river cannot go back. Nobody can go back. The linen of the years. First, there was the house quiet in the valley, watching the forests of pine that inch towards it a slow-moving tide. The wind wakes the morning doves. It roars at the window like a rough sea. A stenciled moon hooks a flaring sky. And here are the stars sinking into the quicksand of deepening light. Who can bear to walk this empty street? The town unfolds like a well-used map forming into forgotten geometries. The dead are not to be bargained with. Wood smoke from across the river troubles my throat. Where are the sleepers buried in the linen of the years? Run away. No one knew I was gone that hazy afternoon decades ago. A girl, wanting her absence to be noticed, packed a brown school suitcase with what I thought necessary. A sandwich, jersey, a blanket, a book, a bottle of water. Pulled the garden gate shut behind me, leaving home. I walked through the sunny brightness of Lawrence Street into the shady boredness of George, leading gradually out of town. I tracked the highway for a while. No one saw me. The dust road into Belmont Valley peeled off like a scab. Suddenly, there were no houses, no fences. In the hot calm, I heard the cicadas buzz. Trees reared up like wayward animals on either side of me, shaggy with leaves and flowers, full of a strange knowing. The farmlands frightened me, their emptiness insouciant. The road wound further and further into the bush, paths like capillaries bleeding off here and there. To follow any of them was a risk too great. I knew the cloudless sky would not shield me from its fierce eye. 
In the valley's hush, my breath sounded ragged, hoarse. What else breathed in the looming shade, the lunging hills? I turned back. Had I hoped for a welcoming? At home, my mother, painting, was surprised I had left. All of my life, I would carry that snapshot of insignificance. Me, standing, shocked, alone, in the hostile valley. This poem is about a little church that I love to visit. It's just around the corner from where I lived. St. Bart's. In the days before they started locking churches, I would walk up Lawrence Street, elude the grasping branches of the jacarandas, their soft, rotting petals, to enter the small stone church on the corner of Bartholomew. Going into that fragrant darkness was like closing my eyes and falling asleep, the dream of finding refuge. I felt the red leather hymnal, its onion skin paper flickered febrile across my fingers and felt the solemn weight of the St. James Bible in my hand. I was looking, looking, I couldn't say what for. A woolen pew cushion coarse against my knees with prayer words on my breath. Was I seeking love? I may even have found it some of those afternoons. My yearning blue as sky seen through cobalt glass, singing songs to a God I believed in. These days, the wooden door is barred shut, and I have lost those eyes ablaze with wonder. Um, my father was an academic, and we went to England a few times with him when he was on sabbatical. So I was eight um, when we went to London. This poem is written from a memory I have of the flat we lived in, in um, Mecklenburg Square in the middle of London. London, 1981. In the flat's living room, the sash windows loomed onto a level roof covered with gravel, an inimical landing place for me and my sister, allowed to play there some somber London afternoons, the subdued roar of Gray's Inn Road traffic below. I remember lonelinesses, Oh, it's gone. Lisa? Um, scroll down. Okay, there. Yeah. Here you go. Stop. Brittle as the burnt orange paper covering my Cat Stevens cassette. His voice, like a reprieve, singing through the strictures of the tape deck. I listen to the wind, to the wind of my soul. And I end up where I think only God really knows. Guitar music pools, plaintive as a room, half lit at dawn, huddles around my parents' low, rumpled bed, forms shrouded in sleep. The fretwork holds me as I ask my question that leaves me lost, like a child's balloon over the city, rising untethered at the mercy of the nascent sky. Tenth birthday. You handed me a package with a watch in it, marking my birthday as I came to your bed that lonely winter morning. The Rothko print in the corner unreachable. Me, mute with my longing for your love. You, a distant invalid in buttoned up Victorian nighty. Dim morning light yellowed the pool blind. Later that day, you put on Marla's Songs of the Earth, heavy as a bowl of stones resting on a table. Monet's field of crimson puppies on the record sleeve, my father's first gift of music to you. The decades below back like soft muslin curtains to show the garden of the soul, burdened childhood trees tangling and the flagstones of my person laid down, flooring me. Okay, we moved to Durban when I was a teenager. Um, and it was a big shock after the driving, after the, sorry, there we go, after the um, arid Eastern Cape to come to a very burdened, lush, jungly place like Durban. Um, and I hope this poem reflects that. Blue reads, Durban's clouds at night glowed neon, so far from Grahamstown's clear starred skies. My father had moved here for his work. We listened to Louis calling for its mate. 
Listless, my sister and I play tennis under fringy penny trees. Their flowers smooth as young girl skin. We ate gazpacho, cooled with ice, red as my vest, appliqued with a heart. My father leaned in to kiss our mother goodbye. The kiss went on forever, as if he was decanting fuel into her for the long way back. I looked away. Driving home, she hardly spoke. After the disco, I was 14, in embroidered muslin, sheer as the moon, standing with a boy in the nightshade of the fig. Streetlight whitened the air rank with refinery smoke, hanging hesitant as our awkward embrace, miles meeting hottest summer. Sweat stubbled the small of my back, my wanting a drawstring gathering cloth in at the waist. The skirt my mother picked out for me at the Indian market swaddled my legs tight as airless afternoons spent kissing pillows, or the back of my hand, lips sticky with gloss. We drank the moment, sweet peach liqueur. Suzanne Vega's voice silken from the flat upstairs. Rain smell, a gossamer cave opened rich as memory. His tongue moved in my mouth urgent as a flying ant, wings lost, tunneling into wet earth. So Lowry's Pass. I actually entered this poem in a competition um, for um, the Isle of Wight. It's a transport-funded competition, and it's written on a bus now. It was one of the prize winners, so I quite like thinking of my poem driving around the Isle of Wight. Solari's Pass. We drove down Solari's Pass in my father's 56. Somerset West, seen from the Merck's windows, splaying like a red sea star under the night's crude black. Smell of diesel and seat leather like dust in my nose. Stately as a ship, we chugged towards the coastal plain, the dark unabridged around us. Sleep like far Cape Town, a diamond galaxy beckoning. Softly, my mother and father talked in front. I leaned on my sister's unconscious form, watching my father shift gears down, down, cream handle gleaming pale fire under his hand. Oh. This was one of um, the seaside um, spots we visited on Sundays near Grahamstown. The river under the trees, soft, dark, still, black the water that reflects webbed branches bending low. People come to the river mouth, their voices fold like wood smoke in the air, float warm in the milkwood's shade. A girl swims to the far bank, leaves a wake of white that disperses like a cloud in wind, irretrievable. The lagoon follows the sea type's ebb, shares the gust, the dust, dusk into gauzy shreds. And another seaside poem, very from when I was very small, Hugga Hugga. I walk time's labyrinth back to summer of salt and ozone. When the rock pool received me, child of nine, sees sonic boom bleaching the beach albino. Like a limpet, the hidden squid attached round my ankle, small suckers puckering my skin taut as a mother's stricken cry. Then his slow unfurling back into the dark, my fright a small stone skimming. Across the sea's vast and moving reach. And here's the name poem for the book about the Palmet River, which flows through Westville in Durban. Night, a grim dog, barks at the cellar clouds. You listen to the palmet rush below the houses. You follow this broad road of sound down to the riverbank, stand on floodlands, gritty, pitted. A peninsula of sand displaces the water, catapults it unseeing into earth. The fast flow plays a counterpoint to the tall trees candling the moon. Fruit bats arrow home under the palms, 
the world pulls folds and close a shifting center. The scar. Okay, this is from the second part of River Fugue, which is more about relationships and less about nature. This is about my son and his father and me. The scar. My eyes that day were all for him, the baby in the summer garden, sitting placid by a water bowl, churning with his small hands the plastic toys he found floating close into inestimable treasures. The light spilled onto the mild green grass, like elderberry cordial, rich and thick, the sounds of the city just audible as my baby crooned to himself, dahlias nodded like benevolent suns. I forgot all about you. Wrestling in the lee of the house, wrestling with memories I couldn't see. The faded running stitch across your wrist, ragged as an old hurt. Your wound and your love, rooting us three in a stoic knot, pocked by unyielding ground. Oh. And this is about the birth of my daughter, your birth. Like an oyster, slowly, incrementally, I made you, my daughter. One heavy-bellied summer night, I dreamt I met you, a flaxen-haired girl on a beach, a stranger, infinitely precious, a pearl sanded with gold. Birthing you was easy. Your brother prepared the way all those years ago. You slipped from between my legs, quick as a silvery fish into the midwife's hands. Your cry surprisingly loud for one so small. The jellyfish of your afterbirth, a slick surprise. While your father held you, blanketed, safe. Your face, a folded dusky rose, I showered. The water as warm as the blood streaming down my thighs. I was queen of the world. Your indigo eyes, my crown of sapphires. Your mouth latched softly onto my breast, a bittersweet pain. Joy flowed like honey through my veins. And this is also about Ella, my daughter, a few years later. Child in the scarf forest. The child in the leafy glade stands still as the elms stretch tall. A lemon dove sandbase in the shade, its breast lifting with each low call. I see with her cerulean gaze the new scarf growing from the old. The wild fig as it breaks in praise, the flowering understory, crimson gold. Like a blue diker, wonder-eyed, from the rot of what has died. She finds the fruit at its seeded core. Great trees mute the urban wall. Joseph at twelve. I thought he was all the 12 and now he's 20. So yeah, this is from eight years ago. Awkwardly perched in the barber's chair, a straggly ibis, your hair feathers your thickening neck. In the winter sun, slaying through leather blinds, middle age settles in the small creases of my face. I help your sister locate Batman on every page of the Marvel comic from the barber's table. There and there and there. His bold mask reveals glinting eyes, undaunted valor. You sit motionless before the mirror, your blood tapping a new dance through your veins. My son, what is it you hear? <clears throat> As the radio plays this slow Wednesday afternoon. And another poem for Joseph, Arrowhead, for Joseph at 15. You were a fish inside me, you grew scales, and then a tail. For a while, you were a sloth, coated in lanugo. Night sleeping intertwined, your mouth fixing on my breast, milky transmissions kept you going, sustaining as my heart. Your energy now is restless, shifting, surprising. The right eyebrow hones to a point on your temple, 
ends and then resumes in a small, fine arrowhead, a lifting wing. At 15, you read your own stories, wash your own body, form your own words. Threshold. My son plays the piano. I think it's his equivalent of writing poetry. Uh, and this is a celebration of his music. Threshold. Evenings, I would wash the dishes while he bent over my piano, lanky as the last rays of sun reaching through my open door. Tender, he stroked the chipped keys, playing his motifs over and over. The chords moved under his big hands like feelings, enveloping the passageways. His longing filled my heart with sound, as when the sea roared beyond the sugar cane. And he nursed at my breast until we fell into deep sleep, the kind that those who have passed through a miracle know. Sometimes he would pause, murmuring under his breath. Once I heard, I'm in love with the world through the eyes of a girl. Stand alone. The river indigo leans tender over my house's roof. But but does not touch the sloping tiles. I pace the floor in my mother's shoes. Their low heels tap the dance of a sad daughter. Her amber shards grab my throat like hands. I smooth her skirt across my pintact belly as I speak my poems with her slow, deep voice. Listen, it has begun to sound like mine. Oh. Dawn, moon. The sun lies low across the stoop. Hens call me from my bed into the winter courtyard, hold as lead. The cats release, they flee the coop. Too cold to stay out, not ready to go in. I pause at the door. From the orchid star tree, I see night gather up his big black coat and clouds shed their numinous skin. The light is rising, nighttime sinks. The frangipani moon, an earlobe, listens in. Hears barking, dogs. Hears shunting, ships. The hen dips her head before she drinks. You can just hold on one minute. Hello. Hello. Yeah, thank you. Westering moon. The moon is not yet down in the west. A porcelain cup, it scoops up the dark from beyond my window. These early hours inch, one moment into the next, slow as light rays lengthening across a pale floor. Death inhabits this winter air. The creaking night trees tear themselves apart. Wrench leaves from the branch. But the moon sends its light to soothe a restless sleeper huddled against the encroaching cold. Um, this poem I entered into um, the poetry competition at McGregor two years ago and it won the Mystic Poetry Competition Prize. It's called The Priest's Garden. I walked down sandstone steps. The sun had chosen me for his disciple. I became the daisy bending low before him, green grass that softened at his footfall. The trees leaned in with a wonder whole as mine. Their leaves shone with the light of a thousand prayers. I followed the first man down the long path towards birds laughing like children in branches. I yearn to reach the one who held the world in civil hands as if it were a holy book. Yeah. 
my love a long unwritten page. How could I see the sorrow there, composting at the fence, or the sapling that had grown towards the falling light, untended? The Old House. This is a house, a holiday house at Nature's Valley. Like our family, that house was all sharp edges, jagged corners. The shower room was small as the cupboard. There being no electricity, its only light came from the gas geezer's pilot, flaring onto walls pungent with mold. On my high bunk, I struggled, tucked immobile under starched sheets and scratchy blankets. The sea's sound traveled to us over dunes, past the scorpion and her rounded stone. Our 70s veranda was a boat's pointed prow. Cresting the night, I stood at the rail. Blanched hibiscus, I flashed my crimson skirt at Orion and his diamond sword. Wanting him to brave the swells, to wound my foes. Gold. My mother, in the red paisley wraparound skirt she loved so much, sat with me on the kitchen steps, peeling gooseberries off their stems. Saffron orbs fell into a bowl. The evening light threaded amber beads around her bowed neck. I am 16 years older now than she was then. Will my children remember me like I remember her? Young, beautiful, laughing, quick hands combing through the tangled stalks, grasping the nuggets like a truth finder. In the hidden womb of the house, their ochre tartness sweet under the thin silk of cream. From the Ridge Along the Durban Ridge, late winter day, the harbour wharves and quays in postcard loss, the water levelled to silver and grey. It is too late to grieve my loss. The absence of love hurts like a betrayer's kiss. I was the child you failed to raise. Walking the lonely hillside streets, I miss your rare tenderness. In the evening's haze, the white yacht at the harbour has set sail. Remorseless as a swan, it glides through piers. Passing cryptic waves that crash against Dolosa, furred with sea green moss. Graveyard. The light washed through the trees in the Grahamstown Cemetery to rinse the tombstones grey as the gravel road that brought us here. Children, we ran between graves lying still as dreamers in their deepest sleep. They were young then, my mother and father, eking a marriage from dry land. I was a girl bearing my rib chest to his camera at our picnic by the dam nearby. My mother and I stood knee high in viscous mud waiting for legavans, watching for legavans in close-knit reeds. I pack these memories, tight as ash, into a small urn, having incinerated the bodies of those long-limbed years. Our conflicts are succulents, surviving in the dirt besides remembrance blocks hard as bone. Writing to forgive, I inscribe all our names. Through trees, we travelled through England, my mother and father and I. The green leaped lovely through spruce trees. Our home in a red brick city glittered, a guiding planet. The road ran true as a river and the light fell like summer rain. Dream fields receded into mist. My mother and father were phosphorescent and the stars were fading into day. Okay, so that's books, poems in my book, and these are poems that I've written subsequently, if we still have some time. Causeway. My cousin took us for a drive around Aston Bay, showed us a beach running wild for miles. It had been raining for weeks, the lagoon nearly level with the causeway, black water blooding the road. Vanessa's stories carried us across the track, my feelings flamingos, one-legged in mud as our children gasped at a rainbow flying up from the wetland, bridging the sky. 
Rose and Doll. Stars reach out to me, bright fingertips brushing the glass, darkness pulses in the throat of the dove. Four of us in the house, dancing with the night gods, while the sky flows like black water through the streets of the little town. If I were a mermaid, I would swim into my children's sleep to find their ocean treasures, bring them up to the light. I cannot know the breath that stirs my son's still form or my daughter's wordless murmur as she meets herself in dream. We who made them raft restless across the stiff sheeted hours and all the while from separate yards, cocks crow for the slow born dawn. A place of many waters. This is another Nature's Valley poem. As I have walked along this beach and wept, so I know my father walked these sands and sang, the sun rising red as a wild plum just beyond reach. October's storms have sliced these dunes to the quick. Laying bare their viney roots and oyster catchers, abandoned nests. The forest hides her entrance for only pilgrims to find. I sought God in the lagoon's clear waters, resurrected by the rising tide, to find my father's face staring back in wonder. The Imaginary Meet me in the imaginary, that echo chamber, never real, sound ravine, trembling cerebral, seismic with thoughts and dreams. Poetry is a headlamp for a spelunker like me, a wavery beam by which to navigate these airless caves that come close as love and the longing to be free. There's water far below, can you swim it, skillful as the whiskered fish which never saw the light of day. There's a mountain in me facing the sea, blasted barren by the big winds. Walk with me there. And we will build a cairn for the voices we lost when they blew away. Little Swords From the street I looked up four stories to see someone pull a curtain across a window. Private as a turning page, the cream square closed over glass mesmerized by scattered light. I drove on. The city dissipating in the afternoon like the mirage of self, heat swelling to become something less definite, tissued soft as a gladiola's little swords. Inside, the ceiling fan beats like a battered heart while night presses his ear to the house to listen. Primal as a father and daughter, these amber shafts flanging the dark. Star streams generating an entropy akin to love, but also hate. Summer's last stand, a bladed lily, wilting crimson as a surface wound. This is my attempt at a political poem. Into the world. I drove my poem as if it were a sedan, easing through Glenwood's shaded streets towards the harbour where brown grass sludged shallow as a canalised river. Through untinted windows, I saw men wait for piecework by the roadside, itinerant as the trucks idling beyond the tidelands. Factories raised their rattling spires, high as ships in dry dock. My words welding water into sheet metal under an immensity of cranes. Arterial, these roots I choose, roaring from an industrial heart. At my back, suburbs fall silent, vanishing like rooks in smog. Um, Edward said that we could share a poem, poet we liked. Um, and I, I just, I've just recently discovered Thomas Transtormer. So I thought that I'd share one poem of his, which um, the last three poems I'll be reading were inspired by, in a sense, not exactly, but similar landscape. Um, he is Swedish, um, 
And I had the fortune, the good fortune to visit Norway last month. And I, I wrote these poems about traveling in Norway. Um, and some are reading a Scandinavian writer and being there just felt quite synchronous to me. Dark shape swimming. So this is the transformer. A stone edge painting on a Sahara boulder, a shadowy shape that swims on some ancient fresh river with no weapon and no plan, neither at rest nor hurrying. The swimmer is parted from his shadow, which is slipping along the bottom. He has fought to get free from millions of sleeping leaves to make it to the other shore and join his shadow again. Okay, and then these are mine. At Flum. We slept at Flum where the railway line ends and cruise ships set sail across the fjord. Silver pistons, waterfalls moved across cliffs, their power audible as the trains. Eleven days I'd waited for blood that would not come my sacrum aching cold as the lake's iced jade. Like visiting a museum, my memories of giving birth, my baby's head dropping, small, round, boulder into my birth canal, pain fierce as hard men tunneling. Under mountains, weeping melted snow. Like little violets, my daughter's newborn eyes, her hair soft as grass tendrils, black as rock. Arstal, jagged as a glacier, bridge, my father's molar fell out in Arstal, age a bleeding gum. I walked with my children in the stave church's emerald graveyard, where headstones stood still as dolmens, my parents waiting quietly in the car. We looked down on mountains reflected in the fjord. <clears throat> climbing like sleepwalkers from its onyx depths. Leaving, I latched the parish gate, its cold iron in my hand, impersonal as a tolling bell. Jotunheim, which actually means land of the giants. All the way up the pass that littering day, they climbed along a road quilled like an inner ear, to reach a plateau where conifers signed to each other, animated as the deaf, in a wind running like an unchecked stream. Three generations knocked like skittles as the camper van twisted and turned. Her father, tired from driving, pulled over to rest, lying on a blanket he set down beside a river and tilting his fedora to divert the sun. Sleepy as the humming bees, She'd wanted to join him, then saw her child throwing sticks from a bridge nearby. Together they watched them swirl, small, helpless canoes, under the dark parapet and beyond the shadows, to snag on rocks where the water laughed, the old man slumbering as they played. And this is the last one, I think. Big star. Through the lowlands, then the highlands, the river running white as old man's hair. At Frick's Dell Farm, I stood where the water cornered tight as a constricted throat, the rapid spray fingertips not reaching my face. They howled them into a constant sorrow. If they were fish, I couldn't see them. As for the birds, they were in hiding. Poplar trees shook their silver coins, a thousand mirrors reflecting how it could have been different. Bellflower sky breaking and breaking into aspects of blue. And that's mm. all I have for you, I think, tonight. Meeting, Zoom meeting. Am, am, am I audible? Yes. All right. Um. Yeah. Thank you, Sarah.
Thank you kindly. Could we all perhaps just um, turn our mics on and, and, and give Sir a round of applause before we um, stop the video and, and, and begin the conversation? Chuck's already raised his hand. <laughs> I've lost track of whether I'm muted or not. I know, I, I can hear you all. Um, thank you, Sarah. I don't know if you if you guys caught me, but we can do the applause after the the questions and comment segment. Um, I'm going to stop. Okay. <clears throat> 